I don't think it is possible to overhype this next video. In an exclusive interview coming up next, two Rock and Roll Hall of Famers share the story of one of the greatest number one hits in the history of the rock era with lyrics that are thousands of years old. There is a season turn, turn, turn. In fact, uh, it's the oldest number one hit in the history of this planet. The story is next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you love the greatest music of the rock and roll era, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, sometimes the 50s, the true classics of our lives, you're gonna love this channel. Make sure to subscribe below right now and click the bell so you never miss out on our daily content. And take a look at our Patreon for another catalog of content that helps us keep this channel daily. So I'm beyond excited to share an interview with you, two Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, on the song that actually inspired me to start Professor of Rock, no joke. Uh, quite a few years back, I was listening to uh, music on my earphones while sleeping like I always do, and I was awakened by the 1965 number one hit, Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds. Everything turn, turn. It's like I saw my life passing before my eyes from these, these life-changing lyrics from the Holy Bible. And I had an idea to get the stories behind the songs from the artists. I'll never forget that feeling, that inspiration that came from this, the Bird's beautiful folk rock hit. Well, a little over a year later, I was actually sitting with Roger McGuinn telling him that exact story. And then about six months after that, uh, I was able to get to, with David Crosby. Here, they not only tell the story of creating their take on Pete Seeger's Turn, Turn, Turn. Do everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a but also how they met and formed the band, The Birds, uh, that's inspired everybody from R.E.M. to Tom Petty to Springsteen to The Smiths. I mean, everybody loves the birds. Turn, Turn, Turn is the song that to just moves your soul. And wait until you hear Roger tell the story. This is one of my favorite videos that I've ever done. And I, I've been waiting a long time for you to see it. So as we go into this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses that I always wear. Make sure to check out latest frames at zenny.com today. Here is the story of the number one hit, Turn, Turn, Turn. Yeah, well, once I heard all this, I asked for a guitar for my 14th birthday. And they gave me one, and I couldn't play it because the action was really high. It was a harmony, six string, with F holes. It's probably set up for some, uh, some band where the, where the guy was going. You know, the kind of guitar playing. Uh, maybe you could do that on it, but I, I couldn't I couldn't play anything on it. It was really, really difficult. Gradually, my parents got me another guitar. I got a K-161 Special, which Jimmy Reed played. On as I do. And it was a, an electric guitar. And that was easy to play. It had a real low action. Now you went to Old Town School of Folk Music, right? I did. And you started to learn the banjo and kind of that finger picking. Tell me about uh, that progression of, of kind of finding your style. Well, I, I learned how to play the banjo. I learned how to play banjo, interestingly enough, on not a banjo, but on the K-161. Because once I got into folk music, I realized that folk singers didn't play electric guitars. So I had no use for, for the K-161 special. I took all the strings off of it and I put a nail on the eighth fret and I tucked a high string under it and tuned it up like a five string banjo. And I learned how to play the banjo chords on it and all the little finger picking things like, uh, you know, Scrug style and, and uh, all the ham rods and things that you do yeah. on a banjo. And interestingly enough, John Lennon learned how to play guitar tuned like a banjo because his mother knew how to play the banjo and she didn't know guitar chords so he <laughs> tuned his guitar up like a banjo and learned how to play on that but that's what that's how i got into the banjo when did you first decide that you wanted to use a rickenbacker the birds were forming at the troubadour in la and we were all big beatles fans we went to see the beatles hard day's night at the pix theater in la <laughs> 
We came out of there and we were just really jazzed. David Crosby started spinning around the light pole like uh, Fred, Fred Astaire. I'm laughing at clouds so dark. It was an amazing. He said, that's what I want to do, man. And we all agreed that, that yeah. was what we wanted to do. And in the movie, George Harrison came out with a guitar that looked like a Rickenbacker six string from the front. But then he turned it sideways and you could see six other tuning pegs sticking down like that at the back. And I went, oh, they arranged a 12 string with a six string head because they saved space. Most 12 strings had a, like a double long head with 12 tuners, six on each side. And they looked kind of silly, you know. They, so Rickenbacker figured out how to make it look really cool. And then they had this kind of spear and they had the spear like a sound hole. And the whole thing looked like uh, 50s sci-fi or something. It was really yeah. beautiful. I went, wow, I got to get one of those. So I traded in my acoustic 12 string that Bobby Darren had given me. It was a Gibson acoustic 12 and a five string banjo. It was a Vega long neck Pete Seeger model. Traded them both in and some cash and got a Rickenbacker electric 12. It was a big deal to get that for me. Tell me the story about when you met the Troubadour and how the birds, kind of the first part of the birds coming together. Walked in the Troubadour like I did every night and uh, there they were, there was Roger and Gene. Roger was an, already an accomplished musician, and Gene was a kid from a family of 11 in the middle of the boondock somewhere who didn't know the rules. So he did things that other people didn't think of because he didn't know not to. If not a genius, he was close. He, he thought up really good music. So I listened to him, and they were playing one of Gene's songs, and Roger could really play. So it, sounded, it was starting to sound pretty good, and they'd both been listening to the Beatles. And that's what Gene was trying to write, and then Roger already knew how to make it sound like that. So I sat down and started singing harmonies. Neither one of them knew me. Now maybe Roger knew who I was, because I think he had met me before when he was working for the Limelighters. And then Crosby came along and started singing harmony, and he wanted to be in the band. And I said, well, we don't really have a band, David. He said, well, if I can be in your band, I know this guy's got a recording studio we could use for free. I said, you're in. <laughs> so that was the beginning of the band. I'm drawn to good music like a fly to honey, it just pulls me hard. I always read that you started out playing bass. No, they wanted me to play they bass. They wanted you to play bass. That's different than playing yeah. bass. <laughs> I tried playing bass. I can't do it. I, uh, I had no talent for it at all. That's when we started looking for somebody else to play bass. I can play rhythm guitar and sing, but playing bass and singing, that's like dialing two telephones, different numbers at the same time. I just. Well, you've been recording with Jim Dixon. Yeah. Because they were the jet set. We, we were trying to think up names. And yeah. that was just one of the first ones we thought of. It's a terrible name. Yeah, well, we kicked around names. I liked jets. I liked air aviation. We met Jim Dixon. He said, mm -hmm. you know, that's not an appropriate name for rock and roll because the jet set has a different connotation. So you need to look for something else. We were sitting at the Thanksgiving table trying to cook up a name. And somebody said, what about the Birdsies? And I said, no, that's too cute. We can't use that. Then somebody else said, well, what about the birds? Well, 64 birds was slang for girls. We didn't want to be the girls. They said, well, that's simple. Change the spelling. What about B-U-R-D-S? Ooh. Then we got the Y and we, we had a name. Kind of like the Beatles changing the E-E -E to the E-A and all Exactly. They, they pointed that out. They said the Beatles changed the spelling in their name. Oh, no. I was talking to Roger. He said that B, they wanted something with B because of Beatles and... Beatles and, and Beach and Boys. Beach Boys, yeah. yeah. Cause and change the spelling. That's a good thing to do. Oh, and I got to tell you, Jim Dixon had a theory about the, the letter B. He said, this, okay, we got the Beach Boys, the Beatles, we got Bobby this and Bobby that, and all the little girls feel kind of cozy and, and safe with a B name because they like Teddy Bear. And Bob Dylan. And yeah, Bob, yeah. Bob this, Bob that, Beatles, Beach Boys, Birds. So that was a consideration in the name. The fascinating part of that early stuff with the birds was when Bob heard that we were going to record Tambourine Man. He came to the studio where we were working every night, learning how to play. We played it for him. And you could hear the gears grinding in there. He's going, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and uh, he went right out and got himself a band right away. He, that wasn't an accident. He realized that, that that music could be translated into that format and that it would be very strong. And he went for it immediately, wow. immediately, and very definitely. 
Gene Clark, of course, left, and that that allowed you to really kind of develop as a songwriter because you started to push even write on your own. A lot of people don't realize you were the first one that popularized Hey Joe or kind of brought that song out. Where are you going with that money? Your hand. Too fast. I did it too fast. <laughs> The interesting stuff that we did was uh, Bob stuff and uh, folk music, Bells of Rimney. What will you give me? Save the sad oh, it's good. That's a good record. Again, Roger had the vision to turn it into a record of a band with electric guitars and bass and drums. Let's talk about Turn, Turn, Turn. That came back in the day when you were working with uh, with Judy, right? I'd heard Pete do it because I was a big fan of Pete Seeger's. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. And then uh, as I was a studio musician in New York, Judy Collins was doing her third album and wanted to do Turn, Turn, Turn on that. And I knew it. It was, you know, part of my repertoire as a folk singer myself. So there it was. It was great. And then after the birds got together somebody asked me if i knew the song now the way pete and judy had done it was different they did like to everything turn 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 to everything turn 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 there is a season turn 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 and a time to every purpose under heaven well i again put a rock beat to it and I, it came out like Everything turns, 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 turns. There is a season, turns, turns, turns. And a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh, a time. So again, I, I changed the chords. I put these passing chords. I got to tell you, a big honor. Pete Seeger put out a book of his songs, and the most recent edition, he changed the song to that arrangement. He, and he sent me a letter saying, you know, I, I want you to know that I think I like that arrangement better. So yeah. Like, wow. wow. Pete wrote a letter. Yeah. Roger still got it. Now, I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but the gist of it was people around where he lived used to think he was a dirty old commie and they didn't like him at all. And after that was a hit, they'd come by and want his autograph. And so he was like, he was stoked about that. He thought we did a good job. Peace, I swear it's not too late. Well, that song, I got to tell you that this whole show was concocted to that song. I was listening to it in my earphones one night at about two in the morning, but I thought about what if we did something that told the story of music as a time machine that takes you back to places you ache to go to again and again. Because to me, this turn, turn, turn to me is that the song of the 60s. It really puts it all in perspective of everything that happened. So, man, thank you. That's amazing. I've got to tell you a story about Pete Seeger talking about turn, turn, turn. They asked him how he came up with the song. He said, well, my publisher sent me a letter saying, Pete, He's got to stop writing these protest songs because I just can't sell them. <laughs> can't you write something like Good Night Irene? Irene, good night. And Pete got <laughs> mad and he pulled a slip of paper out of his pocket and he copied it out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And then he kind of rearranged the words to make it rhyme. And at the end, he put a time for peace. I swear it's not too late. Mm. So it did become a protest song after all. It really but did, yeah. They gave it to the publisher and, they, and he liked it. And so Pete went on with it. He said, I didn't think much of it. I just did it in concert. And then this guy I never met made a number one hit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, thank you for your courage, your inspiration, and giving the world this wonderful song to sing. To everything. It's got the distinction of being the oldest lyrics in a number one hit. Oh, that's good. Another story about it, uh, Jim yeah. Dixon, our manager, didn't want to release it. He was afraid of it, afraid the rock audience would get turned off because of the biblical connotation. And 
Terry Mulcher threw that aside. He said, that's a great record. I'm going to take it up and down the coast of California and play it for every DJ in California. And he did. And it became a regional hit and it swept across the country. And it got to be number one because of Terry Mulcher. Jim Dixon wanted to do another Bob Dylan song, play it safe. Used in, in so much pop culture too, Forrest Gump, used in that, In America, Wonder Years. I think it was actually the first song used in Wonder Years in the first episode. It was right into after the Joe Cocker beginning. Whoa, 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 yeah. 1968, I was 12 years old. That is the song that resonates for the 60s. Again, the anthem that symbolizes that. A time to dance, a time to mourn. There's a great spirituality to that song. When you were recording it, did you feel some of that? And do you feel that now as you're performing it night after night to so many people? I do. I, f I feel it now. And uh, I love it. It's my favorite song. It's my favorite yeah. song because of not just the melody, but the lyrics and what it says. It's very reassuring. And it makes it feel like things are under control. Wasn't that amazing? Uh, make sure to leave us a comment about this master, masterwork, masterpiece of the 60s. What are your thoughts on the song and about the birds and Pete Seeger and pivotal time in the 60s? What are your memories of hearing it for the first time? If you like this video, we invite you to be a full-time part of our community by subscribing below and make sure to check us out on Patreon. That helps us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.